let's get started here. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. My name is Trevor Creed, he, him. I'm a software engineer at Meetup. Welcome to another Meetup Live event. Today, we're joined by Hope Giselle, author and activist, Mandy Giles, advocate and parent of two transgender adults, and Ryan Salins, international speaker and author about current anti-trans legislation and its effects, as well as its historical roots. Learn about ways to advocate for trans rights and protections. If anything you hear is triggering or brings up difficult emotions, please check out these resources that might help you find someone to talk to. This we posted in the chat. Um, I'll start off with some of our community guidelines for the, for the day. Um, this event will be recorded. You will not appear in the video. Um, as a courtesy to um, our speakers today, your audio will be muted during the entire event. Uh, you can submit your, your questions for Q&A at the bottom of your screen and closed captioning is available. To turn it on, click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. Our agenda today, reasonably straightforward. Uh, we'll have a brief introduction of all of our speakers and then we'll do a fireside chat for about 40 minutes and then we'll switch to Q&A. All right, so I'll get started introducing our speakers today. First up, we have Hope Giselle, uh, she, her, hers is a well-known and highly respected national organizer, author, artist, and activist. While navigating through college as an LGBT, LGBT student at the conservative HBCU, she courageously co-founded and governed their first LGBT organization. Giselle ultimately graduated with a master's in fine arts as the first openly trans woman to do so at the institution, as well as acquiring certifications from both Harvard and SHRM. Currently, Hope serves as the training director of Get Fluid, while in tandem working with organizations such as NASA, the Human Rights Campaign, Freedom for All Americans, LGBT University, IT Equality, and Transtech Social. Giselle is also a two-time best-selling author of Until I Met Black Men and Becoming Hope, which focuses on her lived, experience, uh, lived experiences growing up as a Black trans woman in the South. Good to have your help. Thank you for having me. We also have Mandy Giles. She, her, is the parent of two transgender young adults and a fierce advocate for trans kids. Leveraging more than two decades of serving children through educational nonprofits, Mandy founded Parents of Trans Youth as an impact-driven business providing learning, support, and community to parents and caregivers of transgender and gender diverse kids. During the 2021 and 2023 Texas legislative sessions, Mandy has testified before Texas Senate and House committees against multiple bills targeting transgender youth and has spoken publicly in press conferences, town halls, panel discussions, media interviews, and rallies. Thanks for being here, Mandy. Glad to be here. And we have Ryan Salins, MA, is an international speaker and author who specializes in inclusion, diversity, and healthcare. Over the past 20 years, Ryan has worked in the fields of eating disorder recovery, sexual orientation, and gender identity <laughs> development. In 2021, Ryan became the first person outside a lawyer to address the United States courts for a Heritage Month event, Pride Month. And Ryan has authored three, uh, the book, Second Son, Transitioning Towards My Destiny, Love, and Life, Transforming Manhood, A Trans Man's Quest to Build Bridges and Knock Down Walls, and Finding Me, Finding Me, which is forthcoming. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and we'll start off with um, a very important thing, definitions. Um, so I'll throw this out to whoever wants to pick it up. What is transgender? Ooh, loaded question. <laughs> well, um, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, well, I'll just put out here this and then I'll let everybody build upon it because it is a loaded question in the sense that this is an umbrella term. So if we go to the Latin root of trans, it means across from. So originally in the 1990s, when the word transgender was introduced through academia, it was to cross gender, all right? So I was looking at people that cross gender either in a sense of crossing their gender identity, being different from their sex assigned at birth or crossing the gender expression to not fall in line with what we have for social norms. So it's an umbrella term that houses these two categories of gender, one, one sense of self, and two, the way one expresses oneself to the outside world. Definitely. I, I think that to kind of sort of reel it in for folks who heard that and are just like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that for me to define transgender, it is someone who simply understands themselves as different than what the doctors said that they were at birth. And I think that that's just the very rudimentary understanding of it um, and very juvenile way. It's kind of the way that I think I teach it to children or when my little sister was younger and my mom and I were trying to figure out what were we gonna say about you know this change? 
Um, and it was just kind of sort of like not identifying with the, the way that you were, you know, kind of sort of assigned at birth. I'll defer to the experts, y'all. All sounded awesome to me. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much for that support and good foundation for all of our viewers and for myself. I feel like I learned something every time I hear someone make a new definition. Um, and can you all tell me more about your identities? Um, well, I am a trans woman and I identify as such. Um, I think that to give more context to that, uh, as I'm sure Ryan will agree, because we understand that there's a spectrum and it's an umbrella term, I'm what we like to call a binary trans woman, um, meaning that I fall in line with the ways in which society knows women to behave and, and, and the usual suspects of things that you think about when you think about women and people who present as femme. Um, I kind of sort of fall into those things, i.e. stereotypes. So for instance, my favorite color is light pink. <laughs> um, and that is not just because I'm trans, but it's because I genuinely love it. Um, I love to get my nails done. Um, I love a good bikini every now and then. Um, I do not like sports. And these are things that um, I say are stereotypical because I fall into the very binary understanding of what it would mean when you hear the word woman. Um, and it's not to say that you are any more or any less of a woman if these things don't identify with who you are, but that's the type of trans woman that I am. And there are a plethora of different other, you know, expressions of trans womanhood. Um, I identify as um, a cisgender straight woman and um, I have three kids and two of them, um, they're actually twins, are both non-binary, um, which falls under the transgender umbrella um, that we were talking about earlier. Um, so for my kids, because everybody kind of defines that a little bit um, differently, it's very individualistic. Um, for my kids, they both have told me that they um, don't identify as a girl or a boy, but somewhere else on the gender spectrum. And I like to identify as Ryan. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, 18 years ago, actually, is when I did begin my transition from female to male in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, is when I was finishing my last master's program. And I set out on a mission and path to try to break down barriers for people to identify within gender diverse identities to be able to access not only care, but also help those that assist them in guiding them and providing them with medically accurate information. Um, I love to play piano. It's one of my favorite things to do. And besides that, I'm currently training for a triathlon. I've never done one before. So it's a good journey, I think. <laughs> Big goal. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so one of our big topics today is going to be um, the legislation around um, trans issues and the current wave of anti-trans legislation. Um, so to, to ground us in the present and where we are today, um, can you all talk about some of the bills that are being proposed currently? Um, yeah, who do you all want to? <laughs> Go ahead, Hope. I think kind of makes sense. <laughs> what I can say is that so far in 2023, we have about 493 bills mm -hmm. that are already on the floor. And this number is significant to me to name for people because just about two weeks ago, that number was 340, right? And so we acknowledge that not only are these bills out here, but they're also increasing rapidly. Now of this number, I wanna let you all know that 43 of them have obviously failed and they don't work, but a good majority of them are still being discussed and they're a huge part of the problem. And I could tackle specific ones like that we know are happening, like the ones in Iowa and you know a lot of the things that are happening socially within Mississippi and a bunch of different other states, but all of them essentially boil down to one thing, the eradication of trans existence and the confirmation that trans people should not have folks on the outside, i.e. allies, whether it be your own parents or folks that just simply understand how to be on the right side of history with this thing. And I think that the numbers alone should alarm you, but the purpose and the the intent behind why these bills are, you know, put in place are something that I think we don't talk enough about. So do we need to talk about that? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> what are our opinions? I think that that's kind of a good piggyback of what you just mm -hmm. out. Mandy, I'd be interested in hearing. 
Um, yeah, I think um, from my perspective, since I'm from Texas and I'm seeing a lot of these bills, I think I heard somewhere that it's like one third of, of that number is in Texas. Um, I testified against a couple last week, tried to testify against one this week. Um, and what I'm seeing against the bills against kids is, and, and the, the discussion is, um, like you said, the eradication and the um, the erasure of these kids. And, and it's also couched in this narrative that um, trans kids don't know who they are and they're not real um, or valid um, or even like the boogeyman. And so if you frame that narrative and you put out that information, then it's a lot easier to get supporters of these bills and to convince people that it's easier to take away their health care and their access to um, restrooms and facilities at schools or take away their representation in classrooms or books with uh, trans and LGBTQ characters off the shelves. Um, it's it's just that trans youth are already this disenfranchised population and that it's hard for them to have a voice. And so it's just like, a, a huge example of like picking on the little guy. Um, so yeah, what, what do y'all have to say about that? About this? Well, I would like just to add, so I've been doing this work now for 20 years and I've written curriculums that guide some of our major mental or medical healthcare institutions in the nation on this topic and have a new article coming out for the general ethics in 2023. Um, I would say having been someone that is a subject matter expert and writer for e-learning courses, the past 10 years have been very <clears throat> great because the information is going so fast, it's going ahead of the science. And so what we're seeing right now, I do believe in this country, mind you, these bans will be taken down the court of law. They're unconstitutional, they're unethical, and they're inhumane. However, we as a society are set up for checks and balances. And so what we're seeing right now is that people are having a lot of discomfort around how quickly we're moving with this information, how youth are identifying with over 100 terms for the sexual orientation, over 100 terms for their gender identity, and how we're seeing with the Williams Institute reports that oh, transgender adults, that number has been staying steady for how many people identify as transgender adults. However, in the past few years, the number of transgender youth, identif number of youth identifying as transgender has doubled with the highest number being amongst our Latino youth, which is something we also have to think about. So Republicans are trying to push the pause on this. They're trying to push the break. And in the state of Nebraska, I testified against a bill that would ban transgender youth, specifically transgender girls from participating in sports. And I said, there's no emergency from allowing transgender girls to participate in sports. Our real emergency is the mental health of all of our students. Because if we look at the Center for Disease Controls, Youth Risk Behavior Surveys, our mental health for our kids, since 2015, it continues to grow with ongoing loss of hope and persistent sadness and ongoing thoughts of suicide. And so we're seeing this great disruption in our society right now on top of coming out of a pandemic. And so my hope is that we need to have conversation around gender. We have to be able to help guide our youth. We have to recognize that medical curriculums for students, there's still no curriculums for working with the LGBT identities that's consistent, vetted, fully vetted. And so we're going through this disruption. And the hope is that the law will finally come through where we say we need gender equality, like marriage equality, uh, but we also need better education and sounder mental health resources for not only youth, but families and us as adults in general. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, how do these bills that are being passed restrict trans people from their basic human rights? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think that we need to be honest about the idea that it started with healthcare, right? And it started with the basic necessity to be able to go in and see a doctor comfortably. A lot of these bills, before they were even in place, we had incompetent care, right? We had doctors that couldn't go to certain classes to figure out how to properly diagnose us, how to properly even, you know, be able to treat um, us with HRT. Like, so you have a whole bunch of doctors that were saying like, oh, we can give HRT, but then you're sitting in a room and your doctor is asking you how much you think you should be taking. And that's an experience that I think that myself and plenty of other trans people, especially my elders, will probably be able to tell you. So you have a doctor that's YouTubing it as you're YouTubing it because they've had their licenses threatened. And I think that that's one way 
that we can have this conversation. But in, even when we talk about the fact <clears> that <throat> just three or four years ago, we had bills where folks were able to deny you health care because of their religious belief or deny you entry into any building, any business, just because of their belief. So if someone did not believe in the idea or if it went against their religion, they could say, absolutely not, I'm not treating you. And that was legal. And we all know about uh, the way that it was affecting, you know, trans folks in the workplace and especially considering that for a lot of black and brown, you know, trans women specifically, not being able to secure an actual, you know, 1099 job or whatever the case may be, led us to places where a lot of the women ended up on the streets and in sex work. Those are just a small, you know, chink in the armor of the ways in which this stuff is like Ryan has been saying, inhumane and unconstitutionable to be perfectly honest. And these bills are just continuing to build upon the things that were already socially happening, whether people understood that they were, you know, against the law or whether people understood that they were actual laws that had been passed or not. And now folks are having a, a larger conversation about what these bills are going to do and how they can make them worse and how they can expound upon them. And, and, I think that when it comes down to it, the idea that some of us as trans people and then the allies that support us have to even justify why these things are inhumane is an even greater part of the conversation for why we should be discussing this in the first place. I think the concern that I have with these bills, specifically Kentucky, uh, because the governor did veto their ban, uh, which is restrictive of not even be able to talk about orientation of gender in schools, but then also as their language is detransitioning, maybe meaning youth who are currently undergoing um, medical care, which could be puberty blockers or hormone therapy, they would then have to take them off of these medications. And the research highly disagrees with this. In fact, the research ongoingly shows the psychological and physical benefits of youth that are able to access these forms of care. And so this is my biggest concern is when politics and fear goes against science and research. Um, trans people aren't new. In fact, back in 1902, they started to begin exploring removal of ovaries and testicles and also implementations of ovaries and testicles into individuals. Uh, 1920s, we have uh, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld out of Germany that was leading the charge for transgender medicine. 1940s and 50s, we had Dr. Harry Benjamin, who was mentored by, so this is not new to any of us. It's just that we have hyper-focused attention on it now. Um, and again, the con biggest concern is just the mental and physical health of our young people because they are the ones being targeted in this current legislative session. The concern ongoing grows then of, well, where do they stop if this continues? Will it be that they then take away the rights for us transgender adults to have access to the medical care that we have saw and that has been fully internationally researched and vetted? I'm not sure I have much to add in that y'all said it. <laughs> I was going to say, Mandy, if you didn't have much, I want to piggyback off of that and say thank you so much, Ryan, for the reminder of that. And to answer a little bit of your question, I don't think that it does stop. I think that it continues to go. I think it continues to happen at these conferences where people get to say that we want to eradicate trans folks and folks clap after the statement is made, right? I think that a large part of the way that these bills are affecting us is that we're moving backwards. I think when we were first having this conversation around visibility, it was for the sake of being able to educate people around a topic that we thought that folks wanted to know about and not for malicious reasoning. Now, I think that what a lot of us are starting to feel is a little bit of regret around that visibility because it seems that that visibility has made folks upset about our existence, right? Um, and while we understand and we recognize that if we're not visible, then no one has the conversation and we continue to go through the same cycle, but some of that visibility has put us in harm's way. And these are the things that I think that these bills are spewing. So it's not just about this governmental legislative conversation. It is about a social and a colloquial conversation that happens when you're a trans girl who can't even go to the gym at your local YMCA or your school because folks are understanding the conversation that's happening in legislation or what happens when you're a trans man who understands that there are people on the internet who are threatening your safety and also threatening rape 
to knock you down a peg and remind you of your place in the world because they have that much hate in their heart. And there are so many different nuances to this conversation that aren't being discussed that should be brought to the forefront outside of the legislative piece because legislation only works if you understand it. But socially and colloquially, anybody could be having the conversation. And right now we're moving in a very deadly direction with those conversations. And I add for trans men in general, it's very hard for us because we get taken down left and right with really biased and judgmental language. And I keep fighting for it, which is one of the reasons I wrote Transforming Manhood. I didn't want to write that book. It was very difficult for me to write, but I had to, because I did not agree with how we're treating, te teaching young people to speak and label and identify others. Um, there's one other thing that you said, Hope, that I, gosh, I was like, gosh, I really wanted to add on that because you're so right. And I forgot it. It'll come to me later, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll let that one. No, I had a joke. I, I, one day I just wrote on my personal Facebook, which I'm representing myself personally today, not me, it's my business, is that I miss the days from the most annoying things at drag shows were bachelorette parties. <laughs> because were they annoying? Yes, but at least they brought like penis necklaces and straws. <laughs> golden laws. Like the subculture <laughs> to something like, should we really invite people into our subcultures? Because they mainstream takes over it. And then we lose our identities and our funness and our joy and why they were created in the first place. Even the rainbow flag. Please, people, let me, tell me, teach me, like, tell me that you understand that each color represents something about sense of self internal identity, not our external role. Like, if we don't know our history, we shouldn't be messing with it. Indeed. <laughs> we'll be diving deep into the history um, very soon. Um, but before we switch to that, um, can any of you talk about how the bans today extend outside of the states that they're being implemented in um, and how they impact the nation as a whole? I mean, they feed into courage. I, <laughs> I think that that's the one thing that we can all kind of sort of agree on here. These bans don't just stay where they're being placed. These bans give other states and other legislative leaders and other people with hatred in their heart for us as, as, as you know, a community of folks, the wherewithal to say, oh, we're gonna try that now. I think that it's it's fair to say that when something happens in Tennessee, that does affect the way that people start to vote in Mississippi, and that does affect the way that people start to vote in Massachusetts and, te and Texas and everywhere else, which is why we're seeing that there are 47 states, you know, that right now have anti-legislative, you know, pieces of, of um of bills that are, are on the table specifically about trans people and even more specifically about trans youth. And it's not because people cared about trans youth before this, it's because they saw the outcry for the saving of the children. And I think that this is another thing that we have to be mindful of is the ways in which people bite onto ideas. When folks were attacking trans adults, there was a lot more pushback for that, right? Um, and I think a lot of that was because these people are adults, they're, they're, they're grown, they make their own decisions. And so while I might not like it. I don't really feel the need to attack another adult, like let them do their thing, just stay away from me. When you added children to the mix, however, it changed the way that people felt because there are a lot of people who believe that children are incapable of thinking for themselves, let alone being able to tell you who they are. And so now what I think is happening is that we're seeing really what it is, is like a, a piggy, a, a, a piggy bank jumping of people just kind of sort of agreeing with the thing that's popular to agree with because they see that it's working for other people. And that is how we understand and how we know that this is not gonna be an isolated event. People are just gonna find the thing that gets people going, the thing that's provocative and makes people wanna tweet all day. And they're gonna jump on that. And right now it just so happens to be trans youth. But in about two months or so, Who's to say that another conversation won't have people specifically talking about our Latinx, you know, family members and the influx of numbers there? There, there's always going to be, um, there's always going to be a reason to be a part of the conversation that is happening currently, and not the conversation that you want to make a thing, especially if it's been known to fail. They know that they are failing when it talk when it comes down to talking about adults with autonomy. But where they've hit a gold mine recently is being able to talk about people who don't have it all together yet, and being able to use that to their advantage. And that's exactly what they're doing. And I think it's good for our listeners to recognize or understand or learn that we as humans can begin labeling gender as early as 18 to 24 months of age. And the reason why researchers state that is that's when we see language acquisition <clears throat> in children. So children can start voicing either what it is that they see out in the world 
or what it is that they're feeling about themselves as early as 18 to 24 months of age. So when we're talking about transgender youth, we can't just toss them aside and say, well, their brains aren't developed yet. They're too young, it's just a phase um, because it's disrespectful and it's not allowing them their space to have their ongoing development and understanding of self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think the way this is um, spreading beyond um, state uh, lines, th that it's affecting this, like I said, this national conversation. There is so much misinformation out there um, about uh, just thinking about healthcare uh, for trans youth in particular. Um, I was just talking to someone today and because of what she saw in the news and whatever, whatever, she thought surgeries were being done on little kids or whatever, and and they're not. Um, a, a surgery is very rare for kids under 18. And it's just, that's what people think is, is happening because that's this, uh, this narrative that's misinformation that's put out there um, almost in a way like trying to brainwash people um, so that again, those rights can be taken away. All right, moving more into the, the, the history of the legislation. Ryan, I know you are absolutely full of facts. Um, can you talk a little bit about the historical roots of this legislation? Well, I'm not gonna say legislation because I'm not full of those facts and you would have to reach out to a lot of different people in this nation that are very full of them. Uh, I would <laughs> say that when we were talking yesterday, I was speaking more specifically to the work of Susan Stryker, who is an author, professor, a lecturer. I mean, it's an amazing human being. Also, she did a documentary called Screaming Queens, which was actually the first riots, not Stonewall, everybody thinks of Stonewall, but Screaming Queens was about the rights of the Compton cafeterias in San Francisco or in the Tenderloin District. Um, and so just she noted throughout her books that I've read, I mean, I've read everything because that's what I do. I'm a nerd. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that, you know, we, we can see that introductions of transgender individuals within pop culture or mainstream happen, happened actually in the 1930s through um, pop culture psychology magazines. And when the United States really became very well aware of transgender identities or transsexuals, the terminology they were using at the time, uh, was when Christine Jorgensen came out back in 1952. And so the headlines were like, XGI becomes bombshell beauty. And so her story of her going overseas for her transition and coming back was what really opened up the eyes to our mainstream culture, but also people who were trans. They said, Christine's story is my story. And it was like, a, I don't know, it was really a beautiful time of opening it up our identities. In the 19, late 1970s, to early 80s, we had many gender clinics open across the nation that were pre performing gender care. Uh, unfortunately, during that time, a couple of psychiatrists published a terrible study that was not appropriate to ever be. The Internal Review Board would never approve it today. Let me just say, say that, right? Uh, and so they determined then that the transition was cosmetic, exploratory, um, and it was not something that was medically necessary. So insurance companies started to not cover care, and then gender clinics started to close down. And the transgender community then had to go underground. And we really didn't start coming back out into the mainstream culture until 1993 when Brandon Tina, a trans man who's from my state of Nebraska, where I still live, was first sadly raped uh, and then murdered a week later. Uh, Brandon's story was shared through the Hollywood version of Voice Don't Cry with Hilary Swank, but then also the documentary, The Brandon Tina Story. And with that, during the, the um, at the courthouse, when the two men that were up for trial for <clears throat> murder, uh, people from around the nation came to Richardson County in Nebraska, which is a very small county in Southeast Nebraska, uh, that I still do not like to drive through because it creeps me out. Even though I'm gonna be going down there so we can go camping, I don't know why, but anyway. anyway so they came to Richardson County and they stand outside the courthouse with t-shirts that said transsexual menace. Um, this is 1993, it's a very brave thing to do then. And that really started to bring out awareness of this topic again into this nation. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? I mean, I want, and one of the things that I, I always love to bring up is the fact that a lot of folks think that it was a kumbaya hand-holding session amongst all folks within the LGBTQIA plus community. 
Um, and it's quite the contrary. I think that when we started to see the concepts of transgenderism unfold and we were having conversations about it, this was not something that was necessarily welcomed by the vast majority of, I guess what you would say, the mainstream gays, which were at the time specific to lesbian women and gay men. Um, and a lot of us would like to believe that Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and Stormy and all the rest of those folks that did, you know, help with Stonewall were revered as these amazing people and the way that we've rewritten history, like you would think that they were. But when you go into historians and when you go into like the diaries of people who are close friends with them, you would find that a lot of people felt the same way that a lot of cisgender people felt about trans folks at that time. They were gender benders. They didn't understand it. They didn't get it. It didn't make sense to them. And so so the idea that transgenderism is a hard concept is not one that is just specific and, 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 and solely uh, reduced to the idea of people who also identify as heterosexual. There are people within our own community that still struggle, that are, you know, finding ways to cope with, you know, how to exist and coexist with their trans family as well. And this is a part of the history that I think is important because a lot of folks will say things like, well, we've come so far. We have gay men and women that are a part of, you know, these major seats and these major uh, decision making houses in the government. And it's like, that's awesome. But they are also capable of transphobia, transmissia and being transmissic altogether. And so we need to be mindful that just because folks understand parts of each other's struggles, it does not necessarily mean that they are going to advocate, fight or be on the same side of um, and not the opposite side of the argument um, for the sake of their own best judgment in a lot of cases. Mandy, do you have anything to add to that? I think, again, uh, I will defer to the experts on the history. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think this is a, a question that will be um, something you have a lot to say about. Um, so this is our moving into the how can we move forward and what steps can we take now? Um, how can parents of transgender youth protect their children? Um, I um, would say that the number one thing is to start at home and to make sure that your home is 100% loving and supportive for your trans kid and not saying you love them no matter what, or you love them even though they're the transgender. They need to know that you love them and support them because they're transgender. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and parents need to know what kind of environments their kids are in. Uh, what kind of protections do they have at school? Who are their friends? What is your extended family saying and doing? Where does your faith community stand? What are the laws and policies in your state? And when you kind of investigate all that and dig in, you have to be ready to be your child's advocate if you need to step in. And depending on their age, if you have their permission, they may not be out in all these different circles. And I think if any of those environments aren't safe for your kid, then you might have to make some really difficult decisions and make some changes to those environments. Um, and I, I think we might be talking later, but I, those for, for parents, like the very basics, those, those are the ones that I would say. Something I would add, just thinking about all the times I've had youth come up to me after talks or at conferences and just talk with me. Uh, and th they were talking to me because they were scared to come out to their parents. So actually it's quite beautiful to see how many youth are feeling they don't have to keep a secret and they can share mm -hmm. something with their parents today. That's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. We want more of that because the more, more that we hold on to secrets, the more anxiety and depression grows. Uh, but something that I tried to assist youth with is getting outside of the hyper-focus actually of being transgender or of hormone mm -hmm. surgeries. Because even when you have hormones and surgeries, it's not gonna fix what's really hurting you inside. I can tell you that I've gone through it all and what's really hurting you inside, it's still there. So that's just building more of yourself up and having more confidence and just who you are internally, not this external world because this external world is not kind. No matter how you look, uh, I still get bullied today and I'm almost 44, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to get them into what brings them peace and calm. Is it music, mm -hmm. is it writing? 
Is it artwork? Is it going for a walk? The more you can just kind of get into your body and decrease your anxiety and be present and grounded, the more you're going to have a surety within yourself and maybe find something that you didn't realize was there before um, because you were focusing on um, specifically, if I don't get these hormones, I'm going to end my life. We don't want that type of mentality or thinking. The hormones aren't going anywhere. We're going to be able to work through this. Uh, it's more about how we can build confidence and comfort in oneself and discover who you are outside of gender. Isn't that the whole point of what we do this for is to break down gender in general? Uh, I think that's one of the messages I'm trying to get out there right now and pleading to the youth to think about, especially with sexuality. I like to remind them sexuality is not static, meaning it does not, it's not set in stone. Even if you have a label, it's dynamic and it's something that shifts and changes as you age and grow and learn more about who you are in relation to others. I think for me, one of the biggest things that I wish that parents knew and one of the things that I wish that my mom knew is that children aren't stupid. And um, specifically queer kids, there's something about us that even if we're not necessarily like the smartest in algebra or like, you know, like trying to be neuroscience, science, there's something about us that social communication for queer children and, and queer people it's, it, we have to, we have to be like masters at body language and tone and inflection because the difference in someone's body language could be the difference in making it out of this bar or this situation alive or beat up, you know? I, and so the one thing that for parents was always a, a thing for me, the conversations that I had with my mom at 25, once she started to get it together, were conversations that I wish I could have had with her when I was 16. When I was 16 and I was saying, you're not, you know, like this has nothing to do with my safety. It has everything to do with your reputation. And the idea that you're going to have to now defend at the time your gay son is where you are. That it's embarrassment. And if we can talk about that, then we can have a better conversation. You don't have to yell at me. I don't have to yell at you. We can have a conversation about this embarrassment and then we can both be on each other's side and be, be on each other's team. But if you're embarrassed to tell me that it is embarrassing for you as a parent, then I can't help you. And we end up in an argument. And I think that that's one of those things where with these, this new generation of children, it's not just gonna be arguments. You're going to lose your children and it's not gonna be because you've done away with them. It's not gonna be because you all put them out. Like they're not gonna have the experiences that a lot of us had. These kids are going to leave because there are more affirming spaces and there are other parents who are very willing to you know, allow a trans child to come and, and, and seek refuge and come and find a place where they can be themselves and have those hard conversations. And so I think, if I, if I give parents nothing else, having the hard conversations earlier means so much more than doing it when, they're, when your child is 30, right? And they've already processed it for themselves and they've been to the therapy sessions and they have a partner that's supportive and they've created another you know, chosen family that kind of sort of replaces you in that aspect. Like your sorry then doesn't mean as much as it will right now at 13, 15, 17, before they go to college. And so it is okay to be able to say, I love you. I don't know how to cope with the ways in which I'm going to have to deal with the world outside of this home when you come up and I know that people are going to be disrespectful. I don't understand how I'm going to reel your father in or your very religious grandparents in when they come to visit for Thanksgiving or, you know, I don't understand how to have these very rigid conversations with other parents who are going to undoubtedly say things about you without putting myself in a constant state of fight, 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 because there is no flight when it comes to my child, right? And these are conversations that I think that if we were having mutually at the time that it was happening and not always 10 years down the line, me and my mom had a kumbaya moment or me and my father finally got it together. There would be so much more understanding between children and parents that when they do show up to these meetings to be our mouthpiece, they would have more information and be more equipped. When they do decide that they want to engage with the principal or the administration at schools, they would have more information and would be well equipped because they're having the conversation with us at home versus it being something that they have to learn from someone else or versus it being a thing where you can't start advocating for me until, you know, you're already you know, down your own life path and about to move to Florida to retire. There are so many different things that I wish that parents just understood that though it's a hard conversation, it is a well-appreciated one. And especially when it happens earlier, when I can actually 
still find the, the 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 humanity to understand and empathize with you as a parent versus as me as an adult looking at you and saying you did it wrong and I'm happy that you're getting it right now but I'll never forget that you did it wrong first and these are things that I think parents should know I think to piggyback off that hope it's um important for parents to get support too um, uh-huh. and so P flag is a wonderful resource across the nation we have chapters all around any state and combine chapters of P flag mm-hmm. So join with parents and talk about what you're struggling with, because that's one thing I really recognized when I came out to my parents who were, I grew up in a small town conservative in Nebraska, um, you know, and so my parents, they didn't know how to wrap their head around this back in 2005. And I sprung this on them in a letter two, two weeks before I began, when I underwent chest surgery at age 25. And so it's important for parents to also be able to seek support and talk about their fears uh, and concerns um, with other parents. And you can see the healing process with each other because you're going to be in different stages of your grief cycle uh, and different stages of where your child is at and their own form of how they identify. Because again, what trans means today, there's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question right there <laughs> for all of us. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I would say for parents, I recognize this can be a very stressful, this is a rest, this is a very stressful time. Everything's stressful anymore, right? Um, do not show your fears in front of your children. Uh, around their trans identity, because that mm-hmm. increases shame, blame, and guilt. And so find support, talk about your fears, but hold it together for your kids, especially right now. I agree 100%. To, you can have all those um, those complicated feelings, and that's why groups like PFLAG or other support groups are so good to get those out and talk to people who have been there. It's amazing what happens when you have support. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a, a nice segue into our next question. What are some ways we can come together as a community to fight these bills? Well, I mean, we see uh, folks coming together and kind of sort of talking to their local legislation and their their city council people and their governors and their mayors and all of those things. And I think that that's the first step is to let people know that you see what's happening and that you're not just going to sit back and allow those things to happen in your city, your state, your district. And I, I think that oftentimes I see a lot more change. And I'm not sure if Mandy and Ryan will agree I see a lot more change in the states and the places where people actually do go down to the city hall and they have those meetings and they really talk through it because I think that what ends up happening is that those government officials realize that they can't sweep it under the rug and that it's not going to be something that goes unnoticed. And so I, I think that if I had to just give one thing, I would always recommend people to it's nice to post it on social media for people to understand what's happening, but it's another thing for your, you know, your people to understand that their constituents also know what's happening. And we're gonna be at every meeting, every town hall, every time we can show up to your house, we're gonna be there. You know, we're going to peacefully protest until you understand that this is not gonna go away for us. And so we're not gonna let it go away for you. And usually that pressure, even if it does not change their internal feelings about it, it will change what they say on that paper because they no longer want you showing up at their house in their their press conferences because there are so many other things that they wanna focus on in those meetings that they don't want you to pay attention to. So at the at the very least, if we have to do away with this trivial thing that is transgender people's existence as it pertains to the government and the things that we should be focusing on, let's do away with that. And, you know, we live to fight another day. And as, as sucky as it is and as, as, as horrible as it is sometimes to think that all we have to do is show up, I think that it's also interesting to remind people that not everybody is going to be able to do that because in tandem, as I'm sitting here saying like, show up, be there, say the things, you know, get it out. It is okay to be one of the people that understand that your power is, you know, kind of sort of sitting back and allowing other people to do that work. So while I'm saying that that is one of my number one things is to show up, I also want to remind people who are under the sound of my voice and hear this, that this is not me saying that you have to become the warrior for all trans people. If that is not you, if that's not your thing, we all have a place in this fight. But one of my favorite things to do um, as far as combating this stuff is to be able to show them that we see what's happening and we're not going to just let them sweep it under the rug. I think a word that you said there is the thing that came into my mind, constituents, which are the people that the senators are representing. So 
for me personally, my goal and what I've been doing now for 20 years is trying to reach the constituents to break down their own misunderstandings or fears of what this word means and what this looks like. And the more we can get into the rural communities, we can one, open up their hearts, but also then assist the people in those communities that identify this way. Um, because those, those are the areas that we see the biggest support against supporting. I mean, that sounded quite complicated, didn't it? <laughs> so this <laughs> is where we have the standards and they're saying, our constituents don't want this. We're not going to listen to this debate. We're going to sit on the sidelines at the at the Capitol during these debates and chat with our friends drinking coffee or not even be in the room, which is what I saw in Nebraska with the Republicans. So mm -hmm. um, the more we can reach the actual individuals that are the voters and to open up their hearts and minds to this topic and to build compassion along with empathy, the more we're going to be able to decrease this type of anti-legislation being introduced. Just like we thought, saw marriage equality. The more the polls showed that people were supporting marriage equality, we then saw it actually happen. So this is a process, which I think is another important message. All right. This is a fight that we're going to continue. Fights for rights, liberation of body. That's an ongoing thing throughout history, right? And we're in a time right now. Um, so just stay with us. Don't, 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 don't leave this world. Don't think it's better without you because each of us are very unique. And we all contribute something different um, and our perspectives, all of our perspectives, I don't like shutting anyone down, are important to continue these conversations. I think as, as allies, it's important to listen to trans people and listen to what they're saying um, about the issues that are affecting them directly and how they're asking for allies to help. Um, rather than allies saying, oh, I have the solution and let's you know, go do it. Um, that I, this is something, frankly, that, that I've had to learn and that I'm very um, cognizant of and I'm, I'm very hesitant about um, knowing my place in advocating for um, trans youth and, and trans equality um, and knowing that I'm not, my place is not you know, at the, the forefront. Um, and so I, I think, um, and also working with um, organizations, uh, particularly locally, has been really helpful for me as an ally, especially trans-led organizations, to uh, find out more information and more action steps um, and getting plugged in on the local level will help you figure out how to create that change and, and be heard, like you were saying, uh, locally as well. So many good points there. Um, all right, we're moving at a good pace. So uh, I think we can transition over into Q&A now. We have a good number of questions from the audience. Um, so we'll start off with a question from Alex. In your knowledge, how do transgender rights in the US compare to other countries? Thanks, you're all great. Depends on the country. It just depends on the country. Yeah. There's some areas where being even lesbian or gay is not even allowed or uh, made illegal. And for example, just Uganda, just Uganda. Mm -hmm. Uganda. Um, you know, um, there's other states or countries that recognize trans identities, but they're much more conservative in their approach. Um, so it, it just really depends. You'd have to search. I, actually, some people would say we are more progressive and advanced in the United States than other countries are uh, on serving the trans community. Indeed, 110%, especially considering that yeah. um, just looking at places like Brazil, where you have thousands of trans women who are constantly saying that this is not a safe space and refugees and people that want to come to America all the time, that kind of sort of reminds me as a trans woman, like, eh, maybe I should, you know, kind of sort of count my blessings sometimes on, on this side of the fence. And then once again with Uganda um, and, and the laws that they just made, you know, feasible over there, which are asinine and ridiculous, but it's not the first time uh, places like Jamaica, where there are, are video footage of them burning, you know, queer people with tires in the middle of a busy street and nobody stops, you know, like there are definitely places that I think that the laws are a lot more loose around the ways in which people deal with their transmissia. But um, I will say that that doesn't mean that what American trans and gender nonconforming people are experiencing 
um, is not in its own right a form of that. I think that we understand brutality and we understand what those things look like for different people. But I also don't want to minimize what we are going through here just because the government doesn't necessarily allow people to burn us, you know, in the middle of the street yet. Um, without consequence, it does not necessarily mean that what they're not that what they're doing isn't going to possibly lead up to that. Because once again, that is a social construct, right? That That's a social understanding that we are going to burn a queer person in the middle of the street and no one is going to do anything because socially we've agreed that that is okay. I don't think that, you know, the government would necessarily say in those words, it is okay. But when you start to see things like that happening and no one is doing anything, you build your own set of rules. And I'm, I'm afraid that that is where we're heading in, in the US. So while it is a lot more lenient and while I agree with Ryan, a lot of people are saying that, you know, we are cupcakes over here. Um, <laughs> I don't doubt, I, I do not doubt that um, the, the, the bread on cupcakes also gets stale <laughs> after a while. And I, I really think that it's a slow process and that's what the GOP is trying to get us to is that stale bread portion of the cupcake. Um, and I, I really would hate to see what it looks like. All right, this next question comes from Anne. I've heard that many people fear what they don't understand. I realize that we are trying to do a lot to open up and educate the public, but I wonder if we are doing enough. Are there states that are doing a good job of this that others can look at as a model? I want to say yes, but then every time I turn around, there's like something in that state too that's like, <laughs> that makes me say like, hmm, I don't know. I think that if we're having a social conversation about states that get it good, um, I think that New York would uh, be one of those places where people kind of sort of praise just because of the access that you have to other trans folks, the access that you have to programming, and then um, kind of sort of the almost like uh kind of the the way that they were working in the 70s and 80s for uh black and brown moms how they had all these like uh programs for people to go to as long as you fit a certain criteria all of that is happening in new york um and then obviously california la specifically um where there's a bunch of different resources and things but then there's also caveats and nuances to both of those places but i think that um, quite frankly, if I had to think, and based off of what I hear from other trans folks and people who live in those places and have lived and I've lived in those places, those have been some of the most progressive places. And believe it or not, I lived in Texas for a while, had no issues. Had no issues. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so, no issues. But um, outside of the, outside of getting my HRT, I will tell you, like I had no issues with anything else in Texas outside of my health care. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it's also going to be relative to the person, you know, like and what their needs are. Because I also believe that there are a bunch of like my trans mask friends and my trans male friends who will tell you that their biggest needs are their health care. And, you know, they didn't have a necessarily a, a bad social experience in a lot of places. But when it came down to the things that were very important, like how they were going to take care of themselves, they could not, you know, get in to see a, a doctor that wasn't going to be transmissive or, you know, they had people asking inappropriate questions during childbirth and all different types of things. So I think that it just depends on the person. At this point, I, in a way, it doesn't really matter what state you live in, in my opinion, <laughs> just because, again, the education is not there uh, that is fully vetted through a curriculum that is scientifically rooted. Um, and so any state, even in California, I do a lot of work in California, you have very conservative regions where you can't find any care. Um, so you'd have to be like even in Nebraska, go to the big cities to find a provider, but then be on a waiting list and not be able to get in for seven months. So I mean, just our healthcare system in general is a process um, for individuals to have to partake in and undertake. And then again, the fear of how you'll be treated is a whole nother layer, which is a whole nother story for a whole nother day, in my I opinion. Agreed. Yeah. I, I think it's probably the same for, for youth. Um, in Texas, though, in particular, um, we have just another layer um, of the uh, governor's directive to investigate families um, who are helping to get their kids um, gender affirming care um, investigations from CPS. Um, so there's just a lot of families who are, are afraid of being public, like, for instance, going to testify. Um, there are a lot of families who are not going to step foot in that capital. 
um, especially with their kids, because it just, it, it's, it's hard to be, to be themselves there. Um, and I know also trans adults who do not want to go in that building because um, it's a scary place. Um, and I know that other places are like that as well. And, and it all, like I said, it's all kind of depends on the, the context and, and what your needs are and where you are in your journey too. I also just want to say along with this, because I say conservative rural, you know what? There's a lot of beautiful people in conservative rural areas that are actually very supportive of identities. So I also don't want to build up this idea that those are like areas that nobody can exist because it's just not true. You know, I'm going to be doing a, a very rural area here next month for a healthcare agency on this topic because they see the ongoing need uh, and, and also people are impacted because their kids um, are coming out. And so I want to, I just want to put that in there because I don't want to cast this like us versus them because that's my whole goal in life is to not have us versus them. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Awesome, this next question is from Lori. How can I, as a supporter, help further visibility and education about transgender youth and adults? Also, how can I make sure that people know I'm safe to talk to about this subject if they're thinking about this? Well, it kind of depends on how you let people know. Like, if you, like, professionally, uh, if you have subtle symbols, you know, be it a pride flag or a trans pride image, just subtle symbols that are posted, that just kind of lets people know that you are someone that's in the know some way or somehow, right? Uh, another way is to be able to have conversations with people on current events um, that are related to being LGBTQ so that they can see that you are tapped into this, you are aware of it, and you're someone that they can actually have a conversation with. Uh, so I'm going to let other people speak because I'm going to be conscious of time, but those are two things that came into my mind. Access and resources are always a thing that I answer this question with is that sometimes people want to throw money at the situation and run away from it and say like, I donated, right? But sometimes your access and your resource don't always have to be monetary. Um, there are those of you who can offer space for trans youth to, you know, kind of sort of do their podcast out of or a safe space for a trans group who's preparing for like a talent show to get, you know, themselves together that might not be at the local school. Um, access to, you know, um, different things. So for instance, if you're a person who's like a buyer for Macy's and there's a warehouse somewhere in Bumfa, Egypt, excuse my language, but if there's like a warehouse somewhere where there's a bunch of clothes that are going to be eaten by moths in the next six months, why not, you know, donate those to the local trans shelter? Mm -hmm. um, especially considering that a lot of the youth at, that are at homeless shelters are people that identify as LGBTQIA+. And so I think that um, if you're a person who wants to show that putting yourself in those spaces and it doesn't have to necessarily be with your voice all the time, but letting people see that you're the lady that comes with like all of the clothes every month or you're the guy mm -hmm. that shows up, you know, offering the space or you're the person that gave us the MacBooks, you know, I think that those are also ways to show up and show out as an ally and as an accomplice because those are not just things that people can say like, oh, thanks, I bought a burger or thanks, you know, we built a center, but like those are things that people are going to say because of that laptop. I was able to start a, a podcast that I'm now making money off of in a space where I had nothing. Because of those clothes, I was able to go and get a job because I had been told that I was coming in inappropriate for interviews in the past, right? And so these are things that help to you know, save people's lives and put them in different spaces um, and garner them access that they might not have had before. So I think that those are things to consider as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I would agree with with all that. I think sometimes with allies, um, being careful about um, like signaling your support or or doing these things, um, there's a fine line between signaling support and being performative, and 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 having those intentions behind it, and like it's like being an accomplice and actually doing the things, um, because cisgender allies need to bear some of this burden. Um, of, of everything that we've been talking about, bearing a, a lot of the burden um, and not saying, you know, that's, that's not my issue or whatever. And, um, and, and really just standing up and speaking out and doing what you can with what you have. I would love for us all to be introduced to all the beautiful documentaries of the trans community over the past several decades. Mm. So actually hear the stories of people mm. and the lives to really understand more of 
what this means and what it looks like and kind of get out of the headiness and into the heart uh, because uh, that heart is something quite beautiful and the trans history, it's quite exciting actually <laughs> to hear people's stories um, from all forms of identities and all ages. And so I'm hopeful maybe this next decade, we, we can move into that state of uh, the storytelling um, because the more that we connect with our stories, the more we connect with one another. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we are just about at time. Um, so we're gonna share some links in the chat um, from our speakers here today. Um, and I think these will be available somewhere else, but don't quote me on that. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers for coming. Um, I, I really enjoyed this. I found this very informative. Um, thank you so much for everything today. Oh, thank so you. wonderful Bye. being with you all. Thank Thanks you so much. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.